if you can oil seam, for instance, will go down and get it, won't it? Uh, can do, uh, but I mean we've got data from cereals down to a metre twenty, taking out moisture from metre twenty. It seems like the profile of, um, of of water use extraction between oil seeds and cereals is different because one's a very fibrous root system, and it tends to work from the top down. Whereas if you think about uh, oil seeds, often have a tap root. It's also it's more like a vacuum cleaner where it will actually suck from the whole profile more evenly. Yeah, yeah it's not that necessarily that it gets it from it from depth. Um, the, the roots can still be inhibited from getting to depth, just that there's a different transpiration profile for those, for those root structures. So look, I, I'm actually all in favour of, of, of relatively early sowing. Um, sure, you can, go, you can go a bit overboard, um, but you know, I think in, in dry finishes it's, it's a better position to have. You know, we're delivering a lot more grain on early, early sown stuff than late grown stuff. Yeah, I, I would say, say uh, that up until up until about 2000, so the best crop we usually grew actually, I remember often time for planting wheat, probably first week in July, which mm -hmm. which which is that reaction. Most people say shit, that's late, but but it's, it's just sim simply that it, it did limit the amount of top growth yep. and spool. Yep, sure. I, I guess the other thing though is is not we weren't trying to finish off so many heads that those heads actually did finish yep. off a lot better. The other one is, is nitrogen. Because we're retaining a lot more stubble in the system, the, the, the nitrogen availability, whether it's being sucked up by the microbiology or being liberated through uh, mineralisation, is, is a lot more complex than it used to be when everything was taken off and burnt and dead, right? And only added out of a bag. So that changes, but um, sowing earlier, I'm more inclined to use a lot less nitrogen up front. Because the maturity of a plant is really determined by what's called growing day degrees to a certain extent, heat units that hit it, not necessarily by how many, how much, how big it is, okay? So you look at, you remember, like if you see a bit of wheat that falls out of the back of the truck in summer, it'll be in a head in eight weeks, oh, yeah, yeah. right? That's because it's got a lot of heat units around it, even though it's a small plant. We've got to differentiate between the size of a plant versus the maturity of the plant. Now, growing early, if you can contain the size with nitrogen input constraints and actually get it to mature to a certain stage, then you're going to let carry more moisture into spring. So if you're worried about sowing early and growing too much bulk, I'd be more inclined to look at your nitrogen performance as much as anything else. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep, so because there is a set unit it's called phytochrome, and the amount of heat units it takes to get from one leaf to two leaf and two leaf to three leaf and three leaf to four leaf is all exactly the same amount of heat units. And the earlier you sow, therefore the more heat units you will get through, the more the, the, the plant will be mature before winter comes. And if you have less bulk but higher maturity, means that on the back end of winter as growth starts again, you're going to be looking at grain production for that moisture rather than more bulk. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I come from a totally different world where we have too much rain. Yep. Oh, okay. And it's warm. Oh, on the east coast. And uh, I don't have a problem with these people. Uh, except that we, our nitrogen losses, we know, are somewhere, we add between 120 and 150 kg. Yep. Uh, we know the plant gets about 30 of that. The rest is either goes to globalisation or leaching. Yep. Uh, in some cases, it'll drive for pyrite oxidation in the acidic soils, as in the southwest of uh, Western Australia. Mm -hmm. So that once that gets down to a certain level, it's just going to go to drive for pyrite. It, it's not lost to the atmosphere or anything. It just makes it more acid. Uh, <coughs> it's. Um, but all this is governed totally by oxic or inoxic conditions. Yep. The, the, the more water you have trapped in the system, in our case anyway, the more the nitrogen you lose. Sure, I'm actually going to talk exactly about that. Okay. So I might just get on and then we can refine it for that if that's okay. And I'll do it for time. Uh, a few more minutes. A few minutes, okay. Maybe. All right, nitrous oxide, because that's what the question was about. Lucky I'm prepared for that exact question. Um, uh, two things about nitrous oxide. Yeah, yeah, everyone talks about it being 300 times higher than, than um, global warming protection carbon dioxide. Just quickly, um, I was saying on the bus that the microwave ovens work, right, because in a microwave oven you've got water, and the microwaves are a certain wavelength. Remember I was showing you water and it had the bond length? We know exactly the bond length between the hydrogen and oxygen in water, is that that wavelength fits exactly into that length. 
okay, like a skipping rope with a, with a wave in it, fits exactly into that. And that gives it more kinetic energy. As it absorbs those wavelengths, it starts to shake more. So we feel that as heat, so the microwave gets hot, right? If you think about these different um, molecules up in the atmosphere, there's different amount of radiation in the atmosphere, different wavelengths, and some have a higher propensity to, to take them up and to shake more. That's why different gases have different propensities to, to warming potential. It's, it's their fit, if you like, with the resonance of the natural um, stuff in the atmosphere, the natural radiation that's coming through. The other one is the, that um, nitrous oxide is taken over from CFCs as the most serious not, uh, ozone depleting stuff, which has sort of gone off the radar a bit, but uh, is something worth considering if you don't like getting sunburn all the time. Um, nitrate. Okay, what happens is that if you think about your soil microorganisms living, they want to breathe, they want to live. They have the instinct to live like all animals do. Okay, If it becomes waterlogged and there's no free oxygen around, they say, well, rather than die, we're going to try to do something to get oxygen so we can breathe. And effectively what they do is they strip oxygen off, off our eight based chemicals, so our sulphate, our nitrates, okay? But sulphate, if you go past a peat bog with lots of sulphate in it, you'll smell the hydrogen sulphide. The same thing happens with nitrate, but nitrous oxide you can't smell. That's the only difference, huh? So we're stripping off, so the little critters, he's really you know, starting to, uh, to, to tongue it. He thinks, oh, well, I need some oxygen, I'll strip it off. Strips off some more oxygen, strips off some more oxygen. The thing about this is this actually is a gas, so then it has the ability to leave the system. All right? And you look at the ratio, one nitrogen to three oxygens, now we've gone one to two. So we've really switched things around. So basically for every, every two units of this, five oxygens have gone to the microbes. Okay? And this is one of the quandaries where people say, oh, if you do soil health and you have more living things, you're going to have more nitrous oxide. I don't think that's the issue per se. We've got to live with that. All right, so you've got your nitrate living quite happy in a, in a soil pore that's dry. You have some sort of crap like this, no stubble cover, no protection, the Velcro's all getting smashed together, getting waterlogging, anaerobic conditions, nitrogen's just pouring out of there, okay, we just can't see it and can't smell it, but that's basically what's happening. It's full up with water and off it goes. Now, just coming back to this graph, remember we looked at this one before, where we had, you know, the drainage, look at the repeatability. I want to show you this is because here at 20 centimetres and at 10 we see the stepping and at 20 see these small steps getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Okay, can we, can we safely say we have a root system there? I think we can because we're seeing stepping that is in the day-night cycle. If it was drainage it would happen day or night because gravity is always on. If it was evaporation it was losing it, you know, it's down at depth and it's a root system working. You notice when we get this rain here, that we increase our soil moisture at 10, and there's more rain, okay, so we've got back-to-back -back rains, that garden hose effect is really going to start to cut in, and so now we see 20 centimetres start to go up, more rain on top of it, and it peaks out. Now, does anyone want to have a guess, over that next week, we see, what do we see over the next week? Oh, no, no. But, but the roots are there. No, the roots aren't using it. That's right. The roots aren't using it because uh, too high water conditions actually inhibits transpiration. Okay, so you look at cotton back in um, you know the late nineties, traditional eight floods or thereabouts. Right, a lot of people thought that was good because that's what Dad always did, and we got plenty of water. Things changed, and when they actually realised that more often than not they're actually waterlogging it, and so they're actually limiting their transpiration, too much water in the system is that people went to say four irrigations and increased their lint production by 30% and saved half the water. Okay? Because we spent more time in these sort of zones and less time in these sort of zones. Okay? So we know it works. Okay? Greg, now, I also have a guess that it was cloudy for that four day period. Um, yeah, there's probably a bit of cloud around, but you can see... Uh, that, that, that's when we stopped using water. The sugar came to grow. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sure. We see those exactly same effect in irrigated summer crops. Um, so where it's cloudy, where sorry, where it's where it's bright all the time. It's we. It, it's quite a common phenomena, I guess. Um, so, but in our system at the moment, we'd be putting on our nitrogen here. Right. At least in our system, we'd be waiting for the rain. The forecast says it's going to rain, so they go pump all the nitrogen on. And really what we're doing is we're leaving it in anaerobic conditions for two weeks. 
okay? Under anaerobic conditions, we're subject A to leaching and B to the nitrous oxide emissions, that sort of stuff, and we're not very efficient with our plant uptake. What we want to look at is to say, what if we actually in, in get the nitrogen into the plant at this time here, where there's plenty of moisture still to, to support the use of that nitrogen, but in its own right, that nitrogen is only exposed for two days in the soil or for a lower period of time, but also when it's aerobic. Okay, so actually instead of applying traditionally in southern farming systems at least, all the nitrogen is put on before the rain. Maybe we need to be re-looking at that. Okay. There was some research done in WA in the high rainfall zone to try and push yields high, and one of the strategies, well, the outcomes was actually doing that, putting in on after mm -hmm. the front. Yep. Um, and I would assume this is one of the reasons where they're doing those. Yep. Um, I've shown this data to Fran Hoyle, Dan Murphy. I don't know whether they've, they've done anything with it, but I've been harping on about this as some of these guys know for, for a while. Perfect. Anyway, I'll wrap it up there. Oh, this is quick.